Hello, if you're out there, we're hoping that you are. Uh, welcome to the final uh, War Crimes Research Group seminar of what's been an exceptionally interesting series uh, this last term uh, and a half. Uh, I'm James Gow, co-director of the War Crimes Research Group here at King's College London with, with Professor Rachel Kerr. Uh, and it's a great, great pleasure today to welcome you to help us welcome back uh, Tiania Stevens. Uh, Tiania is an alumna of this parish. Uh, she did the MA. Uh, I'm glad to say I don't remember quite how long ago, so we won't embarrass anybody with, with more accurate memories. Uh, but she did that having had a career working in journalism, which continued. Uh, her work had taken her on uh, operations with military forces. Uh, it had involved covering stories uh, around the world in her native Australia, but also in South Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and it included spending time as a journalist in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that's become very much a focus of her work. Uh, and it's a focus, obviously, of the talk today. She's been teaching uh, in media and communication at the University of Sydney, uh, but she's finally, after many years of working, also completing a PhD presently in the final stages at the University of Queensland, uh, where her focus is on the idea of humanitarian journalism, the topic of in part for today. And what she's going to be doing today is introducing us to some of the thinking and this idea of humanitarian journalist in relation to victims, to survivors. Uh, her work involves uh, interviewing Bosnian Muslim survivors from the, the atrocities of the 1990s. Uh, and it involves questioning the way in which journalists approach matters, but I think also the way in which all of us approach these issues, witnessing what happens to victims uh, and the ways in which victims maybe have perhaps continually continue to be victims to revisit their experiences in different ways. Tiania, are you ready to go? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm looking forward to this greatly. I'm gonna hand over to you. Uh, you. We'll be having questions and answers after Tiania's initial presentation. Tiania, please. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you, um, James and Rachel and everyone else for having me um, back to uh, King's. Um, it's a bit strange for me to, to be back, to be doing this, but it's um, it's, a, it's an honour to be back um, in my old, old stomping ground, even though we're on Zoom. Um, it's a shame it's not face to face. Um, I'm going to start um, this presentation by looking um, at an image, uh, this image you can see on the screen, and um, then looking at uh, a few of the case studies um, that I, uh, a few participants that I interviewed um, in Bosnia uh, who were in concentration camps. But first of all, um, I think James has already spelled out my, um, my background, so I don't need to go into um, any of that anymore. So I'll just get started. So, um, as James said, I'm like currently um, almost finished, about to submit my PhD after quite a long stint of trying to get it um, completed and, and changing um, my focus um, from uh, reconciliation in, in Bosnia of concentration camp survivors to humanitarian journalism, which was fitted more of my background. Um, and it's been a long journey to get to um, humanitarian journalism and sort of the ethics of, of how we actually approach these um, survivors and how we how we interview. So um, yeah, so uh, an important part of this thesis looks, or my thesis looks at journalistic representations and misrepresentations of male survivors of atrocity. Um, so my journalism um, back, my journalism path, so I'm, I'm bringing together my journalism past and my scholarly training and increasing sensitivity to humanitarian journalism issues. This particular photo um, was taken, this photo here of um, the coffins and the people surrounding the coffins were taken, it was taken in 2018 in Srebrenica. And now Srebrenica um, was where 
over 8,000 men and boys were um, rounded up onto buses and taken away and killed. And many of them have now been, not all of them, have been found in mass graves um, around Bosnia. Um, so this image was taken and it wasn't just the interviews that I did with the men or with the male survivors, male Muslim survivors of um, concentration camps in Bosnia that drove me to humanitarian journalism. It was actually this image um, that I took. It was just a very, you know, um, obviously not a professional photo. When I was there, um, my focus was not Srebrenica and I didn't actually want to go, um, but I was um, invited um, to go along. And when I got there, I found myself in the middle of this um, commemoration where the bodies were brought from the foot that were found the following year from um, around Bosnia um, who were killed in, in Srebrenica. So I found myself there that day and started questioning what these journalists were actually doing. They, these um, photographers and all the journalists were, that were there. And that was my sort of, that was my key moment um, where I knew that I guess my future was in humanitarian journalism. My research was in humanitarian journalism. I, I just questioned what the process of this was and, and whether or not it was actually ethical to be standing over um, somebody, an old woman that I saw um, and taking photos and interviewing them over a coffin. So this is one of the, this is the image that is one of the reasons why humanitarian has come to be my central research focus, and also the tension between the idea and practice of humanitarian journalism, journalism, and regular um, event-driven, uh, deadline-driven uh, journalist practice. Tiania, yes. Forgive my interrupting. Should we yes. be able to see the image? Yeah. Can you not see it? No, oh God, I'm can't. so sorry. Sorry, I got so caught up okay. in everything. Just bear with I, me. I just wanted. To... No, no, that's okay. That's my fault. I can, I can understand with you. Right. You might not be showing it, but that's all right. I'm just going to share the screen with you. Sorry, that's my fault. There, can you see that now? Yep. Thank you. Sorry. Um, absolutely. Uh, apologies. I just was chatting away there. Okay. Um, just let me move this over. I've just got a double screen. Sorry. Okay, so yeah, so this image is one of the reasons why humanitarian journalism has become my um, central focus. Um, and again, you can see it's really difficult to um, see here, but there is a photographer or a cameraman who is actually um, kneeling over one of the coffins and, um, whoops, sorry, just bear with me. Um, in the red, if you can see the red circle there, um, he's kneeling over the coffin and there's an old lady that he um, is interviewing. So this started to make me think about, again, humanitarian journalism and um, what the issues with humanitarian journalism um, are. So some um, observations. Sorry, for some reason, my PowerPoint has just um, gone a bit funny, but there we go. So. Um, I'll start with um, some definitions of uh, humanitarian journalism that I found in, in my research. The first one is Bunce, Scott and Wright. Bunce, Scott and Wright offer a general definition of humanitarian journalism, namely the production and distribution of factual accounts of crises, events and issues relating to human welfare. So I'm just... Don't know why, sorry, why, yeah, there we go. They, they distinguish two different approaches to this general conception of journalistic activity. There are two. One, humanitarian journalism as a subset of traditional journalism in which one reports factual accounts relating to humanitarian issues. And two, humanitarian journalism as a subset of the tradition of humanitarianism, meaning such journalism aims to alleviate suffering and improve human welfare. The key to this second approach is uh, that of action and intent on the part of the journalist. The intent is to help to ease the suffering of those uh, one reports upon. This is journalism as a tool for direct positive intervention in the world rather than a mere factual reporting on the state of it. As Bunce and colleagues point out, this second approach places humanitarian journalism under the broad umbrella of advocacy journalism that includes movements such as peace journalism and solutions journalism. Journalism that aims to improve to progress social well-being. Um, 
And then we have Dalman and Ubizari, um, who um, uh, wrote a book in, uh, published a book in 2017 on this topic. So Dalman and Ubizari um, argue that humanitarian journalism for the most part is based on good intentions, but sometimes good intentions don't translate into good practice. While working against a backdrop of diversity, vulnerability and complexity, Dalman and Ubizari suggest reporters are burdened with a great responsibility to report fairly and accurately and with care when too often they are untrained in the complexity of humanitarian journalism. They further suggest that the lack of knowledge can have a catastrophic impact on a survivor's well-being, and in the worst case can lead to the media inflicting their own trauma on those affected by human rights abuses. As such, humanitarian journalism is not merely a focus on humanitarian issues, but a practice in support of them. Now, um, Dalman and Nubazari, I say that, you know, they, they have an objective uh, view there. There is a focus on human suffering and problems, but they also look at the traditional objective journalism practices. Um, and however, in Bunce, um, we see more of a focus on advocacy, which can be very political and um, partisan and can become very subjective. It can look, it can look really biased and more like political advocacy. Journalists are meant to be objective recorders and reflectors of facts, like, I guess, like a mirror. Um, we reflect back um, the, we reflect the, the information. You know, it's problematic, not only for journalists, but those who are being represented. So consequently, I have uh, two questions. Um, sorry. Sorry, consequently, I have two questions. Um, if per bunce, humanitarian journalism draws uh, its practitioners towards a so-called advocacy journalism, does this, does this undermine the credibility of such work um, as journalism? And if we are inclined to consider humanitarian journalism as a good thing, whether we lean towards advocacy journalism or not, still might humanitarian journalism often do more harm than good. So my definition taken from both um, Dalman and Ubizari and, and Bunt and colleagues is the pursuit, the production and distribution of factual accounts of crises, events and issues relating to human welfare with the aim of alleviating suffering and improving human welfare. This is my attempt um, to, on one hand to retain the objective mirror like that we reflect information, while also recognising, on the other hand, the positive social good that journalism and journalists can do. Um, so to develop the responses to my two key questions, I now turn to the case of Bosnia, the challenge of humanitarian reporting. Journalists bear witness to the horrific acts of which human beings are capable and the remarkable strength we possess in face of such events. Reporting such things uh, is a crucial way that we learn more about both our positive and negative uh, tendencies. Journalism practice possesses an unavoidable ethical dimension in the case of war, disaster and similar issues. This sense, of, um, this sense is and should be even more pronounced. Journalism practice is ethical, not simply due to its role as a witness to human strength and weakness, but I claim also due to the ease with which journalism is capable of inflicting damage on those it represents. This is a difficult issue for journalists to face. So the case of Bosnia. Now, some of my, um, the, I'm going to look at three case studies in particular, um, three men that um, I interviewed um, while I was in Bosnia, um, particularly 2015 and 2017 and 18. And these three case studies um, have been represented, two have been represented in the press. Both have come to, both of these men have come to feel that the lives have been damaged uh, by this representation. But in the wider journalistic circles, these two representations are often referred to, re um, referred to as examples of humanitarian journalism, although this can be problematic. The third participant in my study wants to be represented. He wants his voice heard, but he feels he's ignored. Um, and there's reasons um, for that, which I will go into. So this is um, an image of, sorry, of Amir. Um, sorry, I don't know why my PowerPoint apologies is um, 
got two screens and they're just it's just back to front um is an image of Amir. The, the Amir is in the center. Can you can you see that, um, James? Can you see the image of yes. Amir? Yes. Just want to check. Clearly. Great. Okay. Um, oh, Amir. I, I will I will note that your title says Omarska, but the figure says Manyacha. He was also in Omarska, so that's thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, he was also in Omarska as well. Um, but this image particularly was taken. Um, uh, was taken at a different camp. He, when I interviewed Amir, we were in an organization sitting there talking and he pulled out an image, uh, this image, and he turned it upside down and he pushed it towards me um, and said, I can't look at this image. I can't stand to look at this image. This is my past. I don't want anything to do with my past anymore. And this image has obviously gone around the world. It's been um, an image that's been used numerous, numerous times um, to reflect um, uh, atrocities in the camps in Bosnia. So um, Amir was one person that um, was wanting to, because he was speaking to me, wanting to be represented, wanting his voice out there, but also at the same time, not wanting to, um, to discuss his past. And the idea of my research um, was that I would go in and interview these men, but it would be on the terms that if they wanted to talk about their camp experiences, they would. I went in to talk about their future, about their life in Bosnia. Now, all these men still live in Bosnia. They live in the areas where they were, um, where the camps are, where they were persecuted, where they were incarcerated. So Amir um, in particular, was um, somebody, again, like the next case study, who didn't want to um, talk about his past, but at the same time, he didn't want people to forget. When I was talking to these men, I made a conscious effort to watch them and listen and not ask. I asked a couple of questions and then I would let them speak. When they were speaking, they would, um, uh, Amir particularly would grab his legs um, in pain from where he was trodden on in the camp. He would sleep on some steps and people would walk up and down the steps and just step on him. So um, he had broken ribs, um, a broken leg, all sorts of um, injuries. And he said to me that, um, you know, that he was constantly in pain, not just emotional, emotional pain, but the pain from his broken bones. So he, he in particular, he looked at me um, in my eyes, but he would grab at his leg. So I, I acknowledged in my research or in my writing um, how these men interacted with me. So that was Amir. Um, oops, sorry. Now we have, I turn to Fikret um, Alic. Uh, some of you, or many of you may be familiar with um, Fikret. Um, Fikret was the emaciated man who, or young man, actually he was 22 at the time in 1992, who was photographed by um, British journalists. Well, some, uh, some video footage was taken and then it was, take, it was turned into images and he was splashed across the Time magazine and a number of other publications without his knowledge. Fikret, um, I interviewed Fikret as well, and he um, made it very clear to me that this image saved a lot of lives, but he would always regret the image. He has never been able to escape the um, the concentration camps. He is still in. He still says he's incarcerated. He, um, the media is at his door constantly. They won't. Um, they won't leave him alone. So the the image next to this one was taken um, uh, ten years after or fifteen years after. I think he, it was an anniversary photo taken by the Sun newspaper in the UK uh, of him posing outside um, in the, exactly the same position, no shirt on, with jeans and a belt holding a shirt with um, with the building behind. Um, they took this image, you know, thinking that it was an anniversary story and that it would um, bring, a, you know, awareness to his story. However, Fikret said to me, he feels obligated to the press. 
in the uh, is obligated is the word that uh, Fikret uses to describe the relationship with the news media. As long as the world is the way it is with torture and war, that picture will always be with me. As long as there is hate and hell in the world, I will love that photo because it is a sign of what people go through. But as long as there is hell, that picture will, will haunt me. So this is some of the damage that the media can inflict on survivors um, when they continuously go back. And I'm gonna be talking about um, some um, uh, points of, of discussion that um, I've come up with to uh, avoid this. Um, and then we have uh, Shreki, Shreki um, who was in Kula camp. Um, he said, I start feeling anxiety the moment I start thinking about the camps in my life now. To be accepted as a citizen, a normal, um, a normal citizen, a, a normal citizen of the town where I was born. I have the feeling that I returned as a citizen of a lower order, lower class. Nothing is the same. It is not how I imagined it. Now, Shreki um, uh, was in um, Kula camp just outside of Sarajevo. He spent a lot longer in this camp than um, some of the other camps that were set up. He, when I met him in 2015, he walked into the organization where I was interviewing some of these men from Kula camp. He walked in with a loaf of bread um so subsequently my um a half a loaf of bread he did and he said that's all he lives on a day he lives on half a loaf of bread nobody recognizes you know the, the suffering that he went through in um uh in cooler camp um he, this was one um survivor who was raped in in the in the camp he was homeless when i met him he, would, um, he was staying at a friend's house just temporarily to look after it, but all he would be able to do was to, to go to a soup kitchen and get, they would give him half a loaf of bread in, in, instead of a couple of pieces of bread. Um, and he said to me that nobody cares about him. He was deported from um, America for beating up somebody. He was deported back to Bosnia and he's just been left to his own devices. He gets no money. Um, no support except from the organization, but again, they are also struggling. And um, he said that at the end of our interview, he said, will you come back? Will you help me? Will I see you again? And this again started raising questions about journalism and um, of advocacy and whether or not we, can st we should step in and, and help. Um, I returned back in 2018 um, to interview um, Shreki and he has disappeared. He, he is no longer, nobody, um, they no longer know where he, where he is. So my key findings. Uh, journalists are too often constrained by their and their industry's concern for what is dramatic, spectacular, and to use the vernacular of the industry itself, sexy. The obvious objection to such a focus is that it risks a slide towards the sensational. The more important point, however, is that a focus on the spectacular risks, in fact, I would suggest um, brings about a lack of concern for even an ignoring of the, uh, you know, the mundane and the undramatic, but still wholly important and newsworthy problems of human beings. Lessons from this study may be helpful in a wider field of humanitarian reporting, however, only if reporters observe um, and are receptive to responses from participants. Humanitarian uh, journalism requires the use of alternative interviewing practices, not normally associated with journalism, but to listen, um, observe and pick up on nuances, nuances and distress to go slowly. So it's important to note that the relationship between the relationship um, between ill health and witnessing, which I was saying with um, people like uh, Fikret and Amir and um, Shreki, they are all ill. They all they all depend on medication. There was a case study that I did um, a, a person, a man that I interviewed who was in Luca camp um, in, from Brochko, and he. I was sitting in his. Um, lounge room um, interviewing him. He was the um, in charge of the camp organization where I was and I was sitting there and I was observing what was going on around me and observing what he was doing and I counted 50 boxes of medication. They were overflowing from, um, from a chest of drawers, they were on the floor, they were just everywhere, at least 50 um, uh, 
boxes of medication. So there is a relationship between ill health and witnessing or talking to the media. Many participants insisted on giving testimony, despite knowing that the outcome of telling their stories could lead to further agitation and disquiet. Some participants said that they would have to take uh, medication to help alleviate the foreboding that something bad could happen after giving testimony. Others were, were reluctant to talk. Many described their struggle to get through a day without medication. Many smoke heavily to help damp down anxiety. All who spoke to me said that doing so could um, exaggerate their physical and mental health problems. What came through during each of my interviews was my participants' desire to ensure people did not forget the horrors they suffered and the struggles that they face today. All participants insisted that their stories be told, regardless of the individual health concerns which may have been um, aggravated by their witnessing. The journalists must grasp those who wish to witness are usually harmed by that witnessing in so far as it hurts them to do it. This harm cannot be avoided. What can be avoided is any unnecessary harm the journalist representation of these witnesses may cause. So my suggestions, or my suggestions for future humanitarian and journalism practice, I return back to the two questions that I originally um, uh, posed that um, uh, if per bunts humanitarian journalism draws its practitioners towards so-called advocacy journalism, does this undermine the credibility of such work as journalism? And if we are inclined to consider humanitarian journalism as a good thing, whether we lean towards advocacy journalism or not, still might humanitarian journalism often do more harm than good. So, oh, sorry, um, it's just a bit of a weird thing with my, with my Zoom. So if um, per bunts, um, you know, humanitarian journalism draws its practitioners towards so-called advocacy journalism, does this undermine the credibility of such work as journalism? Potentially, but not necessarily. In my view, humanitarian journalism is unavoidably liable to creep towards the subjective, advocacy-prone approach. However, being aware of this tendency is one way to avoid falling um, victim to it. So such awareness is uh, partially provided by training. Yet um, there is also a degree of a personal and professional honesty required in order not just to practice humanitarian journalism, but to do so while keeping one's practice on the proper side of the journalism advocacy divide. Journalism is not and should never de uh, degenerate into becoming merely the mouthpiece of this or that political or ideological stance. The human aspect of the humanitarian uh, approach clashes directly with the traditional view of the journalist as some form of mirror of society. Yet perhaps the mirror model of journalism has always been problematic. We are never wholly impartial. So again, this is my attempt um, on one hand to retain the objective mirror bunts of bunts while also recognizing on the other hand, the positive social good that journalism and journalists can do. And um, if we are inclined to consider humanitarian journalism as a good thing for question two, whether we lean towards advocacy journalism or not, still might humanitarian journalism often do more harm than good. Um, journalism rules of conduct can only take journalists so far. They are crucial guides, but ultimately the craft of journalism in the field is immediate and um, is, is immediate. The journalist is time and time again required to make a decision whether or not to intrude into the pain or privacy of his or her subjects. This is a judgment that must be unique to each situation as to when an action amounts to an intrusion and when it does not. This highlights how vital it is um, the ethical and professional training given to journalists. It also underscores the fact that sometimes one just is too inexperienced to handle the situation in an ethically sound manner. However, even when one is experienced, there is always a risk of such reportage. So understanding the needs of those who have experienced the trauma of mass violence is fraught with difficulty. Humanitarian journalists are in a complex position perhaps foremost in these situations is the extreme and hence almost incomprehensible, sorry, nature of the experience itself. How can the journalists understand? To paraphrase one of the participants of the present study, the true nature of life in a concentration camp can only fully be understood by those who have lived behind the wire of such a place. With this in mind, journalists of every kind, oh, sorry, 
not only the humanitarian um, have not only a professional but fundamentally an ethical obligation to avoid the re-traumatizing of their subjects. Thank you very much. That's my presentation. Thank you so much, Tiania. That is such an interesting uh, reflection. Thank you. I'm so sorry. The PowerPoint was just for some reason was off. Like I'd have one and then something else. So it, apologies it, if it, there was a bit. It's fine. We got yeah. there. Uh, uh, I don't know if you, you, you want to leave it up. I suggest you take it down unless you have a particular reason to keep it shared. Uh, I'm just. Um, but, then, oh. but we'll. No, yeah. Done. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was such a fascinating. Uh, reflection. Uh, I can't resist commenting uh, that when you were an MA student there were issues around ethics that came up in terms of your dissertation, uh, as you're fully aware. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting to see the, the trajectory <laughs> over, over a number of years. Now, we're going to take questions uh, from everybody who's with us, who, who, who wants to raise a question. Uh, if you want to ask a question or to indeed to offer a comment and, a f and further reflection on, on any of these issues, you can do that in two ways. One is we're going to be open to people uh, orally contributing their questions. If you want to do that, then please uh, raise the little yellow hand uh, uh, to indicate that you want to do that, uh, but put in the chat as well that you want to do it. If you don't want to give the question uh, orally, then you can just put it in chat. And my colleague Rachel, whoops, we've lost Tiania. Uh, uh, I, I hope she'll be back. Uh, <laughs> My colleague Rachel will be picking questions out from the chat to relay. Uh, so if for some reason you don't want to, 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 to speak or you can't because of your situation, then we'll do that. Uh, but so I hope that's clear. Uh, am I, uh, well, yeah, you're back. Whew, we lost yes, you. For sorry, I lost, yeah, I lost my um, perception. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... So I, 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 I'll repeat for you, I was just giving instructions that if people want to ask a question orally, they can, uh, and they should do that by signaling with their, their, their little yellow hand or putting a message into the chat that they wish to do that. But also, if anybody doesn't want to speak but wants to raise a question and a comment, then put that into the chat uh, and Rachel uh, will pick it up and relay it to us. Before any of that, uh, I'm going to, uh, to, to set th things going with further uh, discussion and reflection. Uh, the first thing that strikes me is this idea, uh, you use the Bunsetal definition, and what struck me in that is the, is the use of the word welfare, because welfare automatically uh, in some way becomes a term of, 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 that's loaded. However, we understand welfare uh, clearly are meant to be a positive attribute. Uh, so whether the focus is on humanitarian issues or whether the focus is advocacy, it's that issue of welfare. Uh, and I'm wondering what kind of issues and problems that really creates if we go on further to think about that. And, and obviously that runs through the whole of your presentation. Uh, in terms of journalist ethics, where there are so many difficult and interesting dimensions uh, and this issue again of focus or advocacy, uh, I wondered uh, on a couple of counts that uh, the way this links to other people's work and activity, and I'm thinking particularly of the uh, first of the issue of witnessing, because what all of this about really is witnessing, as you, you use that word uh, as part yeah. of it. Um, yeah, and uh, I wonder how you, if you've got any thoughts on the way that some journalists, such as Ed Vulliamy, who you, whom you mentioned, Martin Bell, Arnott van Linden, were prepared as journalists to go to be eyewitnesses 
Yeah. And give evidence. Uh, well, well, I'm, well, I'm going, I'm rolling. So just wait a moment, yeah. gathering all in. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think, um, like. Tiania. Yes. Tiania. I you... haven't finished. Let me finish. Oh, it. sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and in that concept, you know, so it's about being witnessing. Uh, and contrasting that with the so-called journalistic ethics of, of most Americans, including David Rohde, who refused to give evidence in court because it's against this code of journalistic ethics, they would say. Uh, uh, and there's people like Michael Nicholson uh, and another journalist who I won't name, but Michael Nicholson because of Natasha's story as a public account of taking a child back, helping one victim. So it's going, I mean, and in all of this, uh, there's the issue of to what extent is there a responsibility, but also to what extent do people become victims? And I'm very conscious that some of those I'm aware who gave evidence as journalists, in a sense, became victims by, by entering in that process. And that links to the idea of witnesses. You mentioned Fikret Alic and the whole idea of witnesses that the ICTY, uh, and, and there's a, a, a very difficult set of questions about people going to give evidence, victim witnesses, uh, uh, in one way or another, who become witness, who become victims all over again by the experience of giving testimony, and I, and I was struck by two things uh, in in your account of, of Fikret Alic on that. One is uh, that the, the obligation, the mission, the duty, and I think that runs through perhaps whether or not you were the person in that uh, that that moment in that photograph but the sense of duty. You know, the same applies to people who experienced the Holocaust who went through Auschwitz with no photographs, perhaps. Uh, and I think beyond this, we also got this idea of, of, of you know, witnessing being about facts, facts being a difficult matter, uh, but facts for journalists, facts for historians and academics, researchers, and facts in trials, all the issue, all in issues of witnessing, presenting a whole range of big questions. Uh, and just finally, before we open up to other people, and I know that questions are coming in in the Q&A chat, uh, oh I just wanted to raise, yeah, I know in your writing, you didn't mention it now, but you quote Anthony Lloyd and the idea of day tripping. And I think in all of this, in the idea of witnessing and the ideas, yeah, whether as journalists or academics, researchers, uh, and indeed uh, those involved in prosecutions at trials, the sense to which, yeah, this is something those from outside can always leave behind, but those who are there, those who are the witnesses are burdened by it. Uh, and I know in the case of victim witnesses or even witnesses at the ICTY, uh, there's an absence of support, the kind of things you were mentioning in terms of going back to journalists. Um, I don't know if we want to go to the other questions uh, that have been raised so far, Rachel, uh, but I have a feeling Tiania wants to come back to me already, but I think we should get, yeah. as, I think we should get as many questions in as we can while we have time. Uh, Why don't we gather in one more um, that somebody's raised their hand. I've got a few raised hands and I've got lots of questions coming in in the chat, some really great questions. So be great if we can get to lots of them. I so um, we can, we can, and Tiania can deal with as much of it as she can in the time left. Yeah, but, why yeah. don't we gather in, um, let's gather in two more and then we'll go back to Tiania and then we'll, we'll take another round after okay. that. So um, the first one is from G Leslie. Do you want to put your mic on and ask your question? Thank you. Okay, um, I was wondering how on earth you can avoid uh, retraining, uh, sorry, re-traumatizing interview, uh, interviewees um, in the course of revisiting events. Um, how, how could one go about that without doing that? Do you think perhaps that people who engage in humanitarian journalism should undergo specific training so that they're in a, they're in a, a position to be able to be more empathetic which could that be something which has gone into? Um, how can you judge those who you feel can be interviewed without it causing them grievous mental trauma? Is that, is that something which you have to be mindful of? And do you feel that it's important that um, there shouldn't be a revisiting of so a, a recontacting of 
those who have previously uh, been contacted regarding that uh, um, person who is forever being photographed so that perhaps there should be an agreement that, that person, once they have taken part, will not again be contacted or will not be uh, re-interviewed unless they have unless they give their express permission. They're not, as it were, feeling hounded and re-traumatized all over again. Do you think all these things need to be taken into consideration? Okay. Uh, Thank you, that's quite a lot there. So um, Tiana, should we go back to you and you can respond yeah. and then we'll gather the rest. Absolutely, I think um, it was a really um, strong question, lots of little questions in there. I think um, particularly from, um, I'm just trying to remember everything you said, but from like, I think what James said about from when I did my MA in war studies and then went like as a journalist to academic, to um, to PhD, like I really struggled with the idea of um, of re-traumatization and the ethics of um, of these interviews of going back. And this is what I discuss in my thesis, and I also talk about it in um, a chapter that I had published. I think James referred to it um, that. There, there isn't a perfect solution and there are going to be times where we do re-traumatise people. But um, if we don't talk to people and we don't return sometimes to them to get their stories, then we would never know what they've been through. We would never know history, what the history is of, you know, of their suffering, of the camps, of, um, you know, I think with the Holocaust in particular, like people didn't really start talking for a number of years afterwards. And, you know, by that stage, you know, people were getting older and everything. So we need to record history. We have to do that. And to do that, we need to, we need to speak to um, survivors of mass violence. Um, that's an absolute given. But I've learned through um, my research that there are, there are ways of doing it. it Training is a good thing, but not all organisations, media organisations are going to implement training in ethics. Um, ethics for me, because I teach ethics at the University um, Media Law and Ethics at University of Sydney, and what I even struggled with that because we learn how the students learn about the philosophy of ethics and how to make decisions. And so I think training really needs to come in university. Um, this is sort of just off the cuff, like, you know, just thinking outside the box needs to come initially, you know, bringing in examples of on, you know, on the ground case studies, like really showing them not just about the philosophy of ethics, you know, like Aristotle or Kant or, or Mill, we need to engage our students and, and then and junior journalists as well in what actually happens on the ground in these in these places and to talk them through you know, being mindful of re-traumatization, maybe some skills that, you know, to um, pick up on nuances, to pick up on things that, like I was doing in my research, pick up on how they're reacting to, to your questions and things like that. Um, you know, this was the same with, like, with Fikrad Alic in particular. Um, he would not look at me. He, he would not have eye contact with me at all for the whole entire interview that I did with him. But at the end, the last question that I asked him as we were walking out was, how are you? And those three words changed everything. It's about sympathizing with them, not making any promises, but watching and listening. And it's as simple as that. It's about watching and observing and listening. Um, and just being mindful, but training absolutely, and I think that's another project. I'm in um, talks with you know to to um, to talk to news organisations to find out what they do with ethics and things like that because I certainly didn't have it. And in response to um, uh, uh, James, I suspect that people like um, Anthony Lloyd. Um, uh, 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 Michael Nicholson um, and Ed Valame also didn't have training in ethics either. We have to go on our own instincts and be, and 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 again, as James mentioned, you know, I've been on a journey, uh, an ethical journey, and I've seen my mistakes, and I've been able to work them into my research and actually turn this around. I don't know if that answers your question. Do you think it should go as far as having actual re uh, role play uh, mock? interviewing of this kind of situation that people will be finding themselves in so that they can be aware of reactions rather than just being textbook 
to actually do it for as it were for real or as as real as it can be. So I guess more- I mean, if we could do that, that would be absolutely wonderful. But a lot of news organisations wouldn't pay for that. So we are left to our own devices to make sure that we are being ethical, that we are, and again, these, these simple points, observe and listen. Because when you observe these participants, when you observe the people you're inter- interviewing, um, you know when you're going to re-traumatize, when something is not right. And I have an exact example, a case study of that, a case in, uh, I was interviewing from Cooler Camp that about 20 minutes in, he kept saying to my interpreter, is she finished, is she finished, is she finished? And I had to make a decision then because I knew at that point that there was something wrong and I ended the interview and I haven't used him in my case studies because he said to me, he said, I'm only here because I was told to be here by the organisation, by the camp organisation, and I ended it. So it's a lot to do with, and, and Anthony Lloyd, particularly in, um, in my work, that when I write about him, he has a, a, a case where he is in, he's a junior journalist, well, actually, he's a freelance journalist, only fresh in, in Bosnia. His first, he, he doesn't even have um, an organisation backing him. He's just there. A um, mortar round goes off. He's up in the, he's in the, um, where he's staying in an apartment. He looks down out of the apartment and he hears this wailing screeching of a mother who is holding her daughter of, of a woman that uh, Anthony Lloyd got to know. He goes, he goes running down. This girl is dead. He has to make a decision at that point. People are saying, take a photo, take a photo, take the image. And he decides at that moment not to take it. It's a really powerful um, uh story he decides at that point not to take this image of this mother wailing with her holding her daughter and instead he steps away and he walks around Sarajevo for the first time he sees the city he he wakes up to the fact that he is a journalist and that's what he's there for and now when I spoke to him I think at the end 2018 um, he said to me that he regrets not taking the image because he's a journalist and that's his job so he's gone from sort of not wanting to take it to to regretting not taking it. So we go through all these changes as a journalist. So I'm conscious of time, so. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, 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 we, we are rapidly losing time. Uh, I, I think Rachel has one or two more oral yeah. questions lined up. Uh, we'll take those and then we'll go through a, a, a run through the ones that have been written into the chat. Uh, but I will point out my mistake earlier. I said to people to signal in the chat, you should be signaling in the Q&A. So if anybody's tried the chat uh, and failed, do what those with more initiative have already done uh, and go to the Q&A and, and, uh, and pursue that line. Uh, Rachel? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'm going to resist the temptation to, to comment on myself. It's such an interesting talk. Thank you, Tiana. Um, so we'll go to Eric Kabandawa and then Andreas Muller, who both have hands up. So Eric first and then Andreas. And then I'm going to round up the questions in the chat and then we'll circle back to you, Tiana, to, to answer them all together, if that's all right. Okay. So Eric, do you want to go ahead? Um, uh, thank you for the interesting uh, uh, topic. I've got two questions. Uh, the first question is on the the viability of uh, humanitarian uh, uh, journalism. Uh, because over the years, we've seen even uh, the biggest humanitarian news organizations that have exclusively over the years dedicated for humanitarian, humanitarian reporting, such as the, the IPS News, hiring Thomson, uh, Thomson Reuters, mm -hmm. are all shrinking. And, and because of uh, lack of uh, viability for their business models, and, and because the mainstream media uh, do not have interest in reporting humanitarian news uh, for the reason that you mentioned that they, they don't have commissioned political interest. What model, if any, you would suggest that humanitarian uh, news organizations can use to one to, uh, uh, to stay uh, afloat and, and, and keep doing the, the good work that they are doing? And last, briefly the the question about the 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 the, the ethics that you you, you the, the question of ethics that you talked about when you're in the field as a journalist i remember the story of the, the voucher and the retro girl that actually sparked a lot of um, of of, of uh, uh, controversy in the past where a photojournalist went into the field 
and saw a vulture trying to um, vulture trying to eat a, a small girl. So the question was, should I take this picture um, or should I not take it and, and, and rescue the girl? Of course, he ended up taking the picture of the girl. Um, it attracted a lot of support, you know, humanitarian support to help the suffering people. But I, I just wanted to take you back. I know you touched on that question. That dilemma seems to have no definite answer on what, what exactly the role of a journalist when a, a dilemma like that, uh, you know, faces them. I would like to um, 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 bring your, your perspective and your experiences on, on that question as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so Andreas, do you want to ask your question next? Hi, um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Tiani, that's really fascinating. So two really quick questions. Um, first one, uh, when thinking about humanitarian journalism potentially doing more harm than good, something you mentioned towards the end, um, is there a way of measuring uh, a piece of humanitarian journalism's overall net impact in some way? And um, how, how might we think about that part of, you know, it's a really interesting idea you mentioned, I'm just curious about that. And, and very quickly, secondly, um, probably controversial and maybe just a flat out no, but um, do or should journalists or news, news agencies bear some sort of legal responsibility for the potential longer term impact of their work um, on individual subjects whose traumatic personal experience are being in some ways exploited for a kind of wider, you know, beneficial purpose perhaps. Thank you. That's all right. Okay. Um, because that question is also asked elsewhere, isn't it, Rachel? Uh, yes, there are questions in the Q&A as well. So if you don't mind, Tiana, I'm going to round up a couple of those too and then come back to you. That's all right. You can answer okay. as much as you can manage in the, okay. in the remaining time. Um, so um, one question was how you reconcile, how do you recon reconcile going slowly through humanitarian journalism with the pressure to report immediately to the public and I think that links to another question about the aim of humanitarian journalism and the, the question that we just had to um, is it about giving a voice to the person who suffers or suffered or is it to raise awareness and maybe provide some help to those people in crisis and then on the topic of health of, of help sorry um, there's the question this may go beyond the scope of your research but do you think there's a moral obligation for news and journalism outlets the profit of stories of individuals in these circumstances to give them a portion of the proceeds. So it's kind of who, who benefits um, from all of this as well, which I think is a really interesting question when you think about individuals too. Yeah. Um, question two from Patrick Lee. Patrick asks, thank you. Thank you so much, Stevens. That was really insightful. When you are conducting interviews with vulnerable persons or NGOs, do you allow the person you're interviewing to review the article paper prior to publication or does that jeopardize the integrity of the paper? Um, so I think I'll leave it there, but that one takes us back to this issue, I think um, around um, ethics, but also I think the crossover and the things that we can learn as academics from this whole, from this discussion around humanitarian journalism and what we're doing um, as researchers too, there seems to be quite a lot of crossover between-, between And Rachel, on, on that, yeah. there was a last question as well which is about the oh. of humanitarian, humanitarian journalist against wider issues, such as privacy, public interest, criminal justice, protection, treatments of witnesses and victims as well. So we can throw that one in. That was from Martin Silcock. Yeah, so, great, yeah. thank you. Sorry, I'd missed that. Great, That's thanks, okay. that, Well, it fitted with what you were saying, so I had to bring it in to be sure. Yeah. Uh, Gianni, back to you. Okay, okay, we let have, me we, we try and cover these. Six minutes for you to... Okay. Um, okay, the first uh, sort of question to do with um, taking photos in the field, I think it was, um, like a humanitarian model for organisations. Um, was that the first one? I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. So again, the humanitarian journalism is very new. It's, there's not that many of us looking at this. And, and to be honest, I fell into this by accident. You know, ethics, again, um, that I've said, wasn't my, wasn't my strong point, you know, as, in a sense, like, you know, working as a journalist. And then I, and, and as James would know, really struggled with, um, 
you know, sort of academia and ethics and, and ethical approvals and things like that. So I think um, it's a very new field and this is something we're working on at the moment, looking towards like some sort of model that, um, and there isn't anything, this is the problem. There's lots of definitions out there. There's lots of, like you can look at peace journalism, which is different and there's a lot more on that um, or advocacy journalism, but humanitarian journalism is very new, like maybe in the last eight, nine years. So, you know, on my hand, I can count the number of academics pretty much that I know of, you know, that um, that I've been using in my research, that there just isn't that many. But in regards to a humanitarian model, um, keep, you know, stay tuned because that is something that we are actually looking at. Um, taking photos in the field. Um, I can't remember exactly what that was about me. I think um, my... My, my role in the field and, and going back to Iraq and Afghanistan and Bosnia particularly, um, it's difficult. And I feel for Anthony Lloyd because when you're in the heat of the moment, you know that as a journalist, you have an instinct, you are born with something in you when, you know, as a journalist and you just do it. And there's not a lot of thinking. And so I'm not convinced that training would have an impact because when you are in the heat of the moment you just get the story um then uh the net impact of measuring what was somebody said something about the net impact measuring humanitarian journalism the net impact on um i'm not quite sure about that one is, i think it was the balance of harm and good being done through humanitarian is there a okay. way of calculating the net outcome in terms of yeah. Again, humanitarian journalism is new. There isn't any kind of um, structure out there or anything at the moment. And again, we're working on this. And I'm hoping now I'm writing, I'm fully into this now. Like this is my this is my field. And um, so these ideas actually that you've given me through these questions are, are things that I will consider and, and look to. But there is there is no measuring of the net impact of humanitarian journalism and how it actually works. But that's a good research um, idea. Um, the journalism news agencies legal responsibilities um uh for and, journalists and moral. And, sorry and moral responsibility yeah okay so um when when we're in the field there is a obviously a legal responsibility of the organization that you work for and there is a responsibility of the journalist as well to to act ethically but um I guess, again, with humanitarian journalism particularly, there's no guidelines. There's nothing. This is, again, very new. So um, legal re you know, responsibility to make sure that we don't, um, you know, we don't bribe. We don't bribe anyone. We don't do anything that is, you know, legally reprehensible. You know, anything that we wouldn't do in our own country, we wouldn't do in somebody else's country where they're, where they're interviewing them. Um, uh, Oh, sorry, I'm just aware of the time. Um, um, uh, uh, reconciling, going slowly. Well, I think with, you know, with digital journalism now, you find a lot of organisations actually have um, uh, long form journalism and then you can flick through the stories and it's absolutely beautiful because you can, you can see part of the story and there's images and you flick through. And I actually think there is still a... Um, a market for for slow journalism for stories for me particularly I think it was like 1989 when I was first sort of starting out and there was a story in the mirror newspaper and on the front there was a picture of a, a young child in Ethiopia or somewhere around the world and it was Anton Antonovich was the journalist and I still remember it because it had such an impact on me and it said on there in, in by the time you turn this page this child will be dead and you turn the page and it's and it tells you and I still have that copy of that newspaper and that had such an impact on me that for me slow journalism long form journalism where you can give a voice to these people to to these victims or to these survivors so that they have an opportunity to say more than just the story of Thicret um you know another image behind the wire like 10 years later um uh, voice uh, awareness and help. Um, 
journalists uh, are naturally curious. They will, you know, we are still human beings at the end of the day, even though people don't always um, view us as that. Um, <laughs> we, you know, when we see somebody that is hurting, somebody that is in pain, somebody that is starving, our natural instincts is to help, to want to help. But again, the question I'm, I guess I've been asking is, does it do more harm than good? And sometimes it does. Like I've been asked for money before to, to get interviews with people, like organizations have asked me for money and I've had to make these ethical decisions either to walk away or to hand over money. And, and you know, most of the time I am on the ethical side and I don't do anything, but to get somebody's voice out, sometimes you need to do things that are slightly unethical, um, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and then also moral obligation to give proceeds. Um, it's very difficult to do that because most of the time you go in, you interview somebody and you leave. And even if you're going back, um, it is it, it can be very unethical and very damaging to promise. Most journalists go in, get to know these people, interview them and leave and ne they never see them again. And a, a lot of the times I had um, participants saying to me, men saying to me, when are you coming back? Will I see you again? Because people make promises and it traumatizes them. So um, to then give proceeds, I just don't think um, that would be an ethical thing to do. Um, review prior publications. Review prior prior publications. I'm, I can't. Remember. I don't know what that question was. Did you, you, know, to ask, did you ask the interviewees to review what you've written? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, not all the time, because obviously with language differences and things like that, there is somebody um, that. Um, and hopefully I think she's here today, but um, I, yes, sometimes I do, depending on what it is and knowing that there could be damage caused by if I have an image or something like that. And so I do speak to them about it and I get their, their um, uh, opinions and their thoughts about whether or not they, you know, want their names and things like that. Everything is um, anonymous. So none of my uh, participants have their names or any identifying um, features. Uh, humanitarian journalism, journalism against the wider justice system, uh, privacy. Again, like I was just saying, all of my participants are, um, there is nothing that um, would identify them in my research um, at all. I make sure everything is taken out. And again, I have to go through um, ethical things, but with journalism, it's very different. And we do see cases where people's identities are, um, are uh, given out by accident and things like that. But with humanitarian journalism in particular, we are meant to be humanitarian. So we are meant to be making sure that we don't harm them. So uh, the idea is that um, privacy should be, um, should be a priority for us. Um, and if they say they don't want to talk or they don't want to go ahead with an interview, for instance, I, and just my last point, um, uh, Kasun Ubizari, actually, one of the, um, uh, the academics that I mentioned, we are working on a project at the moment looking at, which is starting a project, looking at refugees, talking to refugees, Bosnian refugees in Australia as an initial project, um, talking to them about um, how the media represents them, how, how they, but not how we think they're represented, but how they are represented, how they feel represented. What is it that they need to be represented. So we're sort of working on this project at the moment um, about um, turning humanitarian journalism around as such and getting um, the survivors to talk about their experiences. But anyway, sorry, I'm just um, going on. So I think we're over time. We're, we're a wee bit over time, but it's been, been worth it, right. even though some of us already have uh, other and apologies reasons. if I didn't answer those it's questions properly. I just ran through yeah, them. My fault. I'm managing things. Um, I take full responsibility, uh, and that includes for taking things on for another minute or so. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to point out that uh, while you were speaking, uh, indeed, after we were already past time, I think, uh, uh, David Pettigrew, who I know not, but I clearly asked one of the anonymous questions earlier, but now is revealed as David Pettigrew. Uh, put a quick follow up to my question, which is just a comment, so no response needed, but to point out that the survivors feel the need to return to Omarska every year. They go to the commemoration in August, 
Uh, and that's because of the issue of memorialization in particular, because as, uh, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, we, uh, uh, there's no David's more- David's amazing, yeah, I know David. And, uh, and I think, so uh, it, this is all about, you know, the sense of duty, the mission uh, uh, of victims and of others to make sure that there's a focus uh, and that, uh, and, and that uh, a sense of the events and the things that happened is not lost. Uh, Tiania. Uh, you, you, you demonstrated a, a, a wonderful tour de force in, in navigating ethical questions. Uh, when you, in that final round of answers, made a comment about doing something that may be a bit unethical, I would say it's not unethical in the slightest. We have to understand ethics is this 5,000 year long tradition of negotiating complex patterns of wrong and right. Uh, and it's that negotiation and getting to the point of knowing what's right, which sometimes may mean doing something very difficult that in a normal situation you would say absolutely not, but it becomes right once you balance the elements in the context. And I think that idea of a developed sense of ethics uh, is something that really needs to be more widely discussed and explored because we tend, to, many of us, to approach these issues in quite uh, black and white or simplistic ways. I want to thank you you for a great uh, talk. Uh, your focus is journalism, but what comes across to me is that this is all about witnessing. And it, 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 journalism is one form in which witnessing takes place, but ethics and witnessing stemming from this have a number of varieties and it gives a lot of material for all of us to consider, to reflect uh, and to think about as we're going to head. So with all of that, thank you very, very much for coming back to us. Uh, it's lovely to have uh, an alumna back in the fold, uh, such an excellent talk. Uh, uh, and of course, we know for you, it's after 10 in the evening. I hope you had your supper beforehand, uh, but now you can go and relax and get on. Maybe some people here will have time to grab a bit of lunch, uh, but whatever it is, we thank everybody for attending and we thank you for an excellent presentation. It's been really, really engaging and interesting. I'm thank so you happy. So much. To thank you, everyone. Uh, so, thank you, everybody else. Goodbye, and we'll see you when the next round of seminars begins. If anyone, sorry, if anyone wants to email me with a question or something, please do, because obviously I did rush through. If I missed something, I'm quite happy to get emails. So. Thanks, Tiana. Thank you very much. Bye. And, and thanks to to Rachel, of course, for helping out on the questions, and to Danny McDivitt, uh, the School of Security Studies, for man managing the operation. Uh, goodbye, everybody, and we'll see you the next time. And Rachel, you can email me as well. Thanks. See you later. Bye.